Hi, everybody. I hope everyone is having a great day. Mark Stoos here, your host. And uh, this is the award-winning podcast that we call Accelerating Value. To our knowledge, there's not another one out there like this, right? We focus entirely on talking about value creation, how you invest in it, how you defend it, um, how you increase it, expand it. And we talk to all kinds of people across uh, corporations. Uh, so marketers, certainly, salespeople, uh, HR leaders, uh, CFOs, CEOs. We talk to everybody under the sun. And then we also talk to people at different ranks uh, in the organization because depending on where you sit, that determines where you stand on value and how you define it, how you understand it. So what the whole purpose here is, is to get people to share their experience and share their insights uh, around value creation with you in the hopes that it helps you. You find something about what they've said that speaks to you in your experience and you're like, wow, you know what? I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go try that. So that's really what this is all about from our end. Um, and everybody, every guest has a unique point of view on this, right? So uh, that's also the thing that makes this very dynamic and very interesting every single week. Today, we have Julie Brown. Her close friends refer to her as downtown Julie Brown, right? Um, but the bottom line here is that Julie is one of those people who started out in her career doing one thing, and then because of a, an obsession with value and the language around value and being able to demonstrate value, her arc in corporate America has taken her to a very, very different place and a very exalted place. So she is now running business transformation at Johnson Controls, JCI, which is a competitor to companies like Honeywell and, and uh, I don't know, what's another one? Yeah, train. train. Yeah. So, so we're going we're gonna to talk, we're here talking to Julie, right? And, and this is, what you're going to find is that this is the, probably some of the most talking I'm going to be doing for the next 25 minutes. Julie is very eloquent. She speaks volumes. It's just going to be coming at you just like hell won't have it, right? So this is going to be something that you're going to want to download and listen to again as well as, you know, again and again and again because phenomenal reference. She's just amazing in it with her insight. So, Julie, great to have you. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. You, uh, I'm going to try and live up to that great <laughs> <laughs> flattering introduction. Um, but it, it's really exciting to be here talking about value and, uh, you know, how, how that can help and how that can play an in, in arc in, in companies. Because, you know, we're, we're sitting here, you know, at the end of April, you know, we've got hope happening with, you know, the rollout of the vaccine coming out of the pandemic. Um, but I, in many ways, the, the landscape that everyone is doing business in has transformed. Uh, and so the, the criticality of value coming through in every action that's happening within companies, regardless of their size, is, is now just starting to settle in in the, we're at the new normal. Last summer, we talked about what will be. It's here, that foundation, the dust is starting to settle. And all of that, you know, all the HBR case studies that get written in two years, it's all starting now. I would argue it all started about 10 weeks so, ago. So I agree. So one of the things that HBR also has talked about in the past is that all change is a negotiation. Right? Mm -hmm. And that a big part of negotiation, just like a big part of value creation, is the idea of confidence and trust between people and within organizations. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you see that right now against the backdrop of everything that we've all been through in the last 12 to 15 months? And what does that do when you think about business transformation, which is really about you know, value, increasing value, delivering value, either more value, faster value, 
bigger, you know, wider, whatever. How do you how do you think about confidence and trust right now in that in that context? Yeah, it's a good question, Mark. I think there's really two two pillars to that. Uh, one that I think is is very unique to this time, um, which is, in all fairness, having humility. And I'm I'm quoting a good friend, Mark Schaefer, you know, who who's talking about right now. You really need to have the humility to go back and re-listen to your customers. You know, if you thought you knew healthcare, um, it's different now. And we're not seeing the full repercussions of, for example, if, if healthcare is a sector that you work in, um, the, the financial impact of dealing with the pandemic, right? It's creating some new growth lanes, but it's going to put a lot of sectors of healthcare into crisis. So having the humility to go back and revisit, you know, we, Johnson Controls is in a lot of our transportation, right? I mean, airlines are are coming back, they're stepping their way back. What does that mean for airports, stadiums, and entertainment? All of this is at a point right now where they've still got more to learn, but they probably have a better sense as to what is going to be. But that takes a lot of organizational humility to really listen to them and to un kind of listen through that to what could that mean. So that's the, the first part of that. And then the second part is recalibrating on what I call the hard, hard reality, right? Which is the number, are your KPIs still relevant? Are the numbers by which you're assessing your business uh, still the right numbers in this particular climate? You know, that, that's the piece as we look at transforming, for example, our services business, making sure that we're very clear on what's the customer experience we're trying to design, but also what are the KPIs and, and the data because you know it, it, it's that universal language, right? We're talking global transformation that's happening in lots of countries. You know, if you talk about in a service contract standpoint, how many customers renew and how many how much attrition is happening, it doesn't matter what language, what country, that data is a powerful engine to recreating that trust because we all trust that those numbers are in fact kind of the the truth or at least they're all they're all numbers the the piece that i would extend that to is what i'm seeing shift now in the market is the level of granularity you know we had certainly before the pandemic you can look at companies you know like apple um, that we're doing really great work around kind of mass customization, right? And, and we're seeing that now starting to press in on more of the B2B space in, you know, we, we now are starting to talk about micro segmentation and micro verticals, right? So I can't just treat them like healthcare. I have to talk about hospitals. I can't just talk about hospitals. I have to talk about rural hospitals. I can't just talk about rural hospitals. I need to, you know, keep breaking it down. And that's now how those two come together, right? The humility and understanding your customers and having really good data about what's going on so that I can get to those micro verticals to create that new client of kind of tr or climate of trust and respect in the organization that can help you bring people along on your journey of change. Absolutely. One of the, one of the things that's like this, right, is in, in the easy example would be uh, corporate guidance, right? Uh, so a lot mm -hmm. of corporations, public corporations issue annual guidance and then each quarter they report out against that guidance. And sometimes they have to alter their guidance up or down, depending on what's happening. <clears throat> but the bottom line is that the guidance itself is a projection. It's a prediction. It, they're basically saying this is sort of what we promise, you know, with some air quotes around it, right? Um, and then this is how we're doing in terms of executing against that promise. Um, and that the data is, is certainly part of that equation, but the ability to project forward right, and then measure progress against that reasonable or unreasonable goal, right, is a huge part of what 
constitutes trust and confidence between the company and the investors or the market, right? How do you mm -hmm. how do you see that evolving within a corporation today, right? So, in between human beings, it's sort of always been there, right? But the analytical underpinnings, the the data and the analytics that undergird this are intensifying yeah. right now fairly dramatically. How do you how are you seeing this in real life? Uh, you know, I think there's there is a continuation uh, of something that in my mind started decades ago in corporations that's now expanding. It, it's it's getting farther into more and more functions within the business, right? right? And, and you know, we, we've talked about how, you know, if you went back to the, you know, the 1980s and you looked at manufacturing, yeah, they kind of did manufacturing. And then we had, you know, Six Sigma and quality come in and transform how manufacturing is done. And so today, you know, they have, you know, depending on what the manufacturing, I mean, they're, they're measuring inches because they want to take the waste out of the movement from A to B because it's not adding value, right? They, they've figured that out. And with that control comes, to your point, the ability to very accurately predict manufacturing output in the case of a global pandemic and a lot of shipping crises that happen because a ship gets stuck in the Suez, right? Manufacturing supply chains can now very quickly understand the impact of those and start modeling up alternative scenarios to minimize that impact. You know, it, it went from there. You know, I, I the, the story I tell is how, you know, it, imaginary CEO is sitting here, you know, gets that from them, turns around and goes and looks at IT and says, hey, I'm spending a whole lot of money on you. What am I getting for that? And so that's where we started to see things like Oracle and SAP and a lot of that IT transformation kind of come out in the early 2000s and through the, the teens. So that now, you know, if I look at IT, you know, the CIO, the IT partners are really partners in the business and they can, they have gotten to be very adept at making a business case about what they're bringing forward. If they're proposing that they're going to upgrade to the next version of an office suite or, you know, switch vendors on your, your hardware or whatever that may be, going up and using Amazon uh, Web Services or, or somebody else, they're talking about, we're doing this because this is the return that it's going to have on the business. This is the savings. And they're very critically, and I think this is very smart of the IT profession, to constantly be looking at where they have opportunities, talking about how that's not just going to save money, but perhaps by doing this, this is going to help us deliver to our customers. And this is the lift on revenue or profitability that IT is bringing to the business. And so to your question, what I'm seeing in companies is that that pressure is now going to other areas, right? You're starting to hear it in legal departments or if they've outsourced it to law firms, right? Starting to have the, you know, what precisely are you doing around patents to increase the value of my company? Not just, you know, what are you doing to help us in, you know, preventing uh, legal risk through writing better contracts. It's not just about writing good contracts, but the fact that good contracts actually have an impact to the health of the business and eventually gets translated to shareholders. You know, and, uh, another area, and this is one that I'm a lot closer to, is in marketing. Um, you know, it really seeing a lot of pressure coming to the marketing organization and saying, you know, we're, we're, we're spending all of this money to create markets, to create leads, to create opportunities. Help me really understand what marketing's contribution is to that versus the sales reps who get the opportunity. And now that the conversations start evolving a little bit, right, to say, OK, well, if we can better understand what those opportunities are, then I can deploy uh, very rich uh, powerful, impactful uh, sales resources, but maybe I can get span by creating sales channels that sit on the backs of marketing and I don't need to get those sales professionals involved because I can't get enough sales professionals for the amount of growth that I'm going to do. 
Um, and, and that's, it's a tricky conversation to navigate, but at the same time, the, the truth at the bottom of that conversation is there's more growth, you know, it, this is, this is about more opportunity than the sales team can even handle. Right. right? And so it's, and how growth. do I get more efficient? Yeah. Exactly. Right. right. And so this isn't like we're, we're trying to pull it off over here because we aren't going to use you sales reps. It's like, no, we've got we, we need all of you and then some. Um, but the trick in that then ties back to my point on data, which is uh, making some of those functions, being able to shift their footing from a retrospective on what did they do and what was the value to actually being able to forecast. Because as you mentioned, as, as we talk about earnings and valuations of companies, that's what it's all about is the, the guidance that says, you know, if I invest in hiring this many more salespeople, I know at this it takes them this much time to ramp up, I get this much coverage, and this is the lift that I'm going to get. Conversely, when there's really hard decisions that have to be made, you know, the reality is a, a president of a business, when they take 50 sales reps out, they know it's going to hurt, but they understand what that hurt is. IT, in many cases, has gotten themselves to being able to articulate that, yes, when they make cuts, that's going to hurt, but now the CFO, the CEO, they have understandings of those trade-offs. And the change that's happening in companies is they're starting to look at every single function and expecting that function to work that way. The really the, the huge opportunity that, that I find really exciting for marketers is that if you can work through that and it's change and it can be uncomfortable because it creates maybe some transparency and accountability, but it moves you into a position of respect within the organization and it moves you into a position of resources within the organization, right? Because... You know, I think I was sharing with you, I was on a, a call listening in with um, our, our CEO a few weeks ago, and he said, listen, we're not just going to spend $200 million. We need to know what we're going to spend it on and what we're going to get out of it. And, and, and that's just a flat truth, whether it's on marketing or IT or supply chain or procurement or a new manufacturing plant or sales headcount. That's the, that's the transformation that's happening in the business right now. Yeah, I mean, in, in particularly given the the speed of change and the volatility of the of the overall world situation um, across many different vectors, right? That really amps that up even more. You know, yeah. Right. How do you how do you think right. about? So let's let's go to that next step then. How do you think about risk today? Because like as a, as leading change right? There's risk associated with that change. So you, you, some people would argue that you are a risk creator, right? And yet you're also mitigating risk, right? Because you're trying to let go of identifiable risk and, it, and you may be incurring some new risk, but it's all kind of in there together, right? And that overall, right. if we just stay static, Okay, we got a problem. We got that's the biggest risk of all, right? So right. how do you how that, do you that, think about that? Yeah, I mean that that's actually you just, that's how we think about it, which is doing nothing is death. Right? And I would rather self inflict the pain than have someone else than, do it for you. <laughs> have it inflicted upon me. I, I, I talk about just in family, you know, things. I've, I've got some some young people that I work with. I'm like going, listen, welcome to being a grown up. A lot of things are choosing your least bad option. And when, when you're looking at risk, it's, you know, if for a company like Johnson Controls, we've just got huge opportunity on the agenda that is happening right now. You know, buildings consume a significant portion of energy, right? So if you really want to help with the environment and sustainability on the planet, which we know has a direct causal correlation to the quality of people's lives, right? You can do that by improving your buildings. But if we don't change how we as 
look at servicing those buildings, providing technology that goes into those buildings, right? The, the world's going to figure it out another way. Um, and oftentimes in a way that's more clumsy, it's less efficient. But that also requires us to think and work very differently from how we have before. You know, in, in our case, it's, you know, making sure that there's an arc between the products and the people that come into buildings and service those. Uh, making sure that what that experience is when they come in the buildings, you know, when, when you're looking at really changing lives and the talent and technology and, and people that are in the trades, that's how we're looking at risk is, you know, it's, it's not just risk for our company, but part of because of what Johnson Controls is doing, it, it's, it's risk for a lot of people where, you know, resources are getting more scarce, energy conservation is becoming a really important part of how we as, as a, a global community deal with some of the hardest problems that we're facing today. So let's, I want to follow up on that this way. So we're a lot of times, and I think you, you, we saw some of that in the in the president's speech um, two nights ago mm -hmm. and stuff with the infrastructure renewal. We're talking about really significant capital expenditures mm -hmm. um, that that hit companies. So we'll stick with companies as opposed to the country. Hit companies uh, in 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 different ways, right? And yep. The speed to value is really crucial as a way of de-risking that investment. And, and again, that, that, that right there applies on both CapEx and OpEx, right? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how are you reimagining the way that you help your customers gain value while de-risking the capital piece? Oh, it's a great question. So. You know, one of the the transformations and, and that, that we look at a lot are, and, and a lot of companies are, is focusing more and more on kind of what's their ultimate mission, what are their outcomes, and what can be done to actually align your align your value and your delivery to that mission, right? So, you know, I, I, I think of... Um, you know, even other industries like like airlines and, and aircraft engines, right, where they shifted very quickly, not very quickly, but they shifted from paying for the engine itself sitting on the wing, right, to we're just going to make sure it always stays up for you. Right, up time. And you're going to always have flight time off our engine, right? And, and it's that's that's the value to de-risking is saying, we're looking at what's the value, you know, airport, stadium, university, hospital, you know, data center. What is it that your mission is? And in our case of buildings, right? How do I line up behind that value to say, what are we doing to make sure data center that data centers use a lot of energy? We're, we're now lining up behind making sure that we're helping you in your energy goals, we're helping you in your availability, right? Because if a Google data center goes down or an Amazon data center goes down, that's a really bad day, right? How do we make sure that our offerings and our services now start moving to a model of prediction, right? So can you look at the equipment and see how it's running and go, oh, hey, we're starting to see these things. And when we know that these things happen, if we start taking these countermeasures now, we can actually prevent, we can predict that there might be a hiccup and we can start preventing that. And that starts aligning the value and the risk of we've lowered their risk, we're bringing more value and we're doing it in a way that anticipates issues, whether that's in, you know, security platforms, fire platforms, or, you know, it, but it, it extends to so, multiple. So it businesses. sounds like then that the, that the real kind of revolution here after a lot of yakety yakety yak for the last 10 or 15 years about it, right. Is that, you know, historically a, a situation like yours, big capital expenditure, the first thing that, a big company like JCI or Honeywell or HP or anyone else would do is they, they would introduce the customer to their 
financing options, right? Their financing department, right? And they kind of, they bundle it all up, right, into kind of a glorified loan, right? Um, what I hear you talking about is that while some of that still may continue or, or not, right, that really the emphasis is on really speeding up time to value in in ways that are really super provable and that also adhere mm -hmm. to a predictive promise. Right. Right. And so then you, you're absolutely right. And that, so then let, let's circle back to your earlier question about what, what's changing within businesses, right? So uh, the example and the, the conversation I've had with, with one of my colleagues is and I, I use the example of sales, right? If I add 50 headcount to my business, I, I, I know how long that's gonna take to add value, right? The speed to value that happens as a company in the market comes from being able to now do that in more and more functions. Where can I get that predictability in HR processes around talent development? And bring, you know, we, I mean, a huge portion of our business is tied to the trades, right? And, and, and there's just such a need for people with that background. Um, but getting those skills to them, how do I figure out a way to speed the value of getting people technically competent in trades in against technologies that are changing faster and faster and in HR, can I start doing predictive modeling on when I bring in tradespeople, how fast can I train them? How quickly can I get them up to journeyman status that not only has an impact on their earning power, but what we're able to do with those resources? You know, another one, and, and you and I are, are uh, you know, working on this is in marketing, right? To not just say, you know, I'm gonna run this campaign and I'm gonna get this many leads, but to be able to actually, you know, use a technology like Proof Analytics to actually say, you know, this is how much I'm spending on marketing and to the earnings, to the forecasting, being able to now say, these campaigns in marketing in this period of time are going to be delivering this much revenue to you. not just leads, not just website clicks. This is how much revenue at this level of profitability that the company can count on it. Oh, by the way, you know, it, it, that campaign, that marketing function that had inside sales, the most effective piece in that is inside sales. So if you double your spend in inside sales, I can change the arc and make that faster or higher. And here's, you know, here's a range, but here's still the lift range I'm looking at. And that kind of comes back to our opening point about, you know, trust and respect. You need real numbers and data to do that. And that's, you know, when I look at, you know, my time in marketing and, and the marketers that I work with, that's the piece that gets really exciting, right? Because they kind of, if you're in a role in a company where you're feeling like we can never get enough resources, right, that, you know, how come it's always we're sitting here with just this little bit and everything is going into another function, right? I don't know, sales gets it or manufacturing or quality or, or wherever you want it, you're seeing those re innovation and ideation, right? I mean, those are choices that in all candor, somebody probably did a better job articulating the business case behind what the forecasted future return was for that investment in that manufacturing capability versus that ad campaign. And I think that's one thing for for business, anybody who's in businesses, you know, trying to lead teams to keep in mind is, you know, you, there's a little bit of internal friendly competition, right? The, the company doesn't have infinite resources and the company is trying to de-risk and the company is trying to show valuation. Cost. And so yeah. opportunity cost comes out and that CEO that's got $200 million to spend, he's going to put it with the leader that he thinks has made the best case and is able to prove that that case is founded on the highest reliability of being able to deliver that. Does that answer oh, your question, yeah, Mark? Absolutely. So last question. So you're yeah. leading change. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and, and I'm sure that you're, you know, there's, I mean, pretty much everybody like you has a similar point of view on this, but I just really want to hear you talk about it for a second. What is your biggest obstacle to driving internal change? They're, they're related. As much as we talk about data, companies are still living organizations and the people in them and the communication and, and getting their hearts and minds, you know, behind it. I, I, I was talking a little bit about, you know, um, linear and nonlinear growth, right? And so it's really easy for someone it, to come to an understandable conclusion that if I'm going to start automating more and more of these sales related functions, well, does that mean you don't need sales reps anymore? It, the exact opposite is true. I need sales reps more than ever, but I need them doing the highest order, highest value, most skilled things. I'm trying to get the piddly little stuff that eats up their time that actually they're probably not uh, as in, enthralled with. You know, we, we were doing some benchmarking with other companies and, you know, looking again at a lot of the technicians in the field, you know, and looking at other companies and saying, you know, what is it that we can do that maybe we can get the equipment to solve on its own instead of having to send a technician? And in every industry where this has happened, the reality is you actually need more technicians at the end of the day because as you're finding more of these things, you're then finding the bigger things that really need their talents and the thing that humans are never going to leave the equation on, which is problem solving. The creative problem solving that you need, whether it's a chiller plant or a complex fire system, that never, ever goes away. And using all of this data that can help predict that just helps us do a better job and find areas that have had risk from a building standpoint of failure that have been at risk for years. We just haven't been able to see it until the catastrophic things happen. And as you open that up, you start seeing it just more and more. Awesome conversation, Julie. Thank you so much. This has been terrific. I, I think that all of you guys really seriously should like, played this multiple times because there's just a lot of gold uh, in the last 40 minutes. And I'd like to point out that it's a very rare podcast that we do that goes beyond 25 minutes. So this is like 80% more than normal. And there's a reason for that. So I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>